It's the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte and the governing body of all their special assessments and taxing districts for which said board so acts is now meeting a regular session. Only those items that indicate a specific time will be heard at that assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. Um, at this point, could uh, Supervisor Finnegan, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Is there any introduction of new employees? Yes, there is. Oh, good. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Christopher Thorpe, Veteran Service Office. I'd like to introduce our new office assistant, Samantha Isdell. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Morning. Thank you. Welcome. 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 It's a pleasure to be working for Veteran Services. I hope for many great work and many years to come with Chris. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Good to have you. Okay. Okay, and Chris, you're going to be ready for your PowerPoint presentation sometime in the next couple meetings, right? Okay, yeah. just, just checking. Okay, uh, Councilor, are there any reportable access from closed session? Nothing to report at this point, though we will be continuing closed session after the meeting. Okay. Um, at this point, I'll, are there any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda at this time? In order to add an item to the agenda, the matter must have come to the attention of the county subsequent to the posting of the agenda, and the matter requires action before the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Supervi uh, Chair, uh, yeah. I noticed uh, on budget transfer there was an error, small error of $1, but item number 13, uh, uh, there was an, an error in our notes as compared to the actual budget transfer. I just want to make a note of that and have it corrected. Okay. It says 10,942 was a transfer. Actually, the, the note said 10,941. <clears throat> it's a simple arithmetic error. I'd just like the record be straight. Okay. Got it. Okay, so we'll. The uh, transfer itself has the 942, so we'll, we'll just make sure that so it's, the, the memo it's correct, so we'll make sure that that is consistent. Okay. All right. Any other additions, corrections to the minutes no. or to the meeting? Okay, um, and I, just for the public, uh, we, we did have a closed session that went longer than usual. That's why and we're actually extending it to after the meeting. That's why we started three minutes later today. Um, and for those of you not aware, we're going to have two meetings in a row today and, and next Tuesday typically. Traditionally, the board meetings have been the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. Uh, we had a furlough day and a holiday last Tuesday, so the, mo the meeting got pushed to today and then we'll have a meeting right after. So those of you that really love attending board meetings or watching them on TV, then you got two weeks in a row. So anyway, uh, at this point, uh, we're gonna now hear brief reports and announcements from board members related to programs, projects, travels, and committees. Uh, Supervisor Gitlin, would you like to start? Yes, I would, and <clears throat> I have a lot to tell you about, so <laughs> hold on, this is a knee ride. Uh, we'll start with January 24th. I attended the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District meeting assisted the air quality director Martin in securing location to place uh, the state-of-the-art equipment uh, in measuring particulates in Del Norte County where uh, Ed Fulton I think you're working with uh, uh, Mr. Martin down there and we're looking for a site for him uh, to check our which we already know is our very clean air we just need affirmation on that uh, the uh, uh, We've invited our director Rick Martin to an upcoming board meeting to make a presentation on behalf of the board. I uh, attended the Chamber of Commerce monthly meeting. The Chamber is actively looking for a new director for both the Chamber and the Visitors Bureau. I think we're about to make an announcement on that. <clears throat> I also challenged the Chamber to add one new event for calendar year 2013 and for each subsequent year, one additional event over the next five years. The Chamber does an excellent job in presenting uh, events and there are currently four of them we just like the calendar filled up um, the ch chamber also plans a retreat probably in March to brainstorm new ideas in, in an effort to enhance our local business I uh, also want to congratulate Walmart general manager Nick Ganella for his recent chamber award uh, Walmart has and continues to be a powerful economic force in Del Norte County employs over 250 people congratulations to Nick um, <clears throat> Uh, had a LAPCO meeting on Monday the 18th. Uh, 
It's the Del Norte Local Agency Formation Commission. We elected new officers. Supervisor Hemmington stepped down as the chair. Commission elected City Councilman Rick Holly as the new chair, and yours truly, I will be the uh, vice chair. Uh, At-large members have been serving with no remuneration on that board, which I feel is unfair. And at the upcoming commission meeting, which will be next Monday, I'll be putting forth a motion to include a small stipend for members of the community who <clears throat> selflessly serve. Uh, the commission also approved its 2013 monthly meeting schedule, and <clears throat> that which will be the fourth Monday of each month at the Flynn Center. Uh, Wednesday, January 30th, I met with the National Tea Party Group, including Director Jenny Beth Martin, the Tea Party reaffirmed it in its brief and powerful purpose, no deficit spending, constitutional adherence, opposition of the Affordable Health Care Act, and no new taxes. All of these goals are enthusiastically embraced by me. <clears throat> met with Heidi Kunstall and Tina McClendon on a particular problematic corner in Delnor County, that's Harold and Hoover Streets, just east of the Social Security Office. We're looking at options to either possibly shave down that hill in the middle of the street or install a four-way sign at the corner of Hoover and um, Harold. Uh, also, uh, pleased to report the board that <clears throat> I have elected uh, a community outreach program in terms of uh, our Take a Bite Out of Blight program, uh, Jordan Recovery Group, and the Our Daily Bread Ministries will be assisting us in setting up a non-government program to help people clean up their properties in Del Norte County, the needy, disabled and we're very enthusiastic about that we're looking at active partners to contribute through grant money to help fund this initially we're going to clean up Delnor County one house at a time uh, during this process I spoke with a councilman in Southington Kentucky uh, excuse me Southington Connecticut who shared uh, some valuable information about his community's efforts in what's called take a bite out of blight program uh, councilman Al Natelli suggested that the county raise its fees for the twice offended, twice cited offender from $15, which I think it's currently at now, to $100 per citation. He also suggested an establishment of a revolving bank account as we have so we have plenty of resources to clean up the blight. It sounds like a very good idea to me and we'll pr be pursuing that here. Uh, this program is actually a non-governmental community outreach program where uh, we'll assist these uh, partners, uh, disabled elderly homeowners in cleaning up their homes, um, removing of trash and eyesore blight, uh, cutting back of brush, which detracts from the neighborhood. Uh, we'll be meeting with the code enforcement officer, Dave Mason, to review some of the neediest homes in our county. Uh, Friday, February 1st, help cut the ribbon at Del Norte's newest uh, business. That's Wild Rivers Market, owned by Rick and Mary Littlefield. Go see the folks there. Uh, Tom and I, and also Angie and I, enjoyed a great lunch at folks uh, at the Senior Center last week, and Saturday 2-2, we attended a celebration of life for a great patriot, a man who left our world way too soon. That would be Robert Rice, just 54 years. He was a great American in the brief time that I knew him. 2-3, uh, February 3rd, uh, enjoyed breakfast at St. Joseph's Church. Um, met uh, Republican Central Committee meeting at Toreros on the 5th. Thursday, Thursday the 7th, attended an organizing meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers to remedy some of the problems related to the jetty. The following issues were ironed out. We have new signage that will soon be developed. New safety resources will be installed to improve the rescue efforts for Del Norte uh, County search and rescue folks. And the collection of fees will be allowed to help cover the costs involved in saving lives of those who are swept off the jetty. I just want to add that it's a uh, really a pleasure to work uh, with the federal folks and I was so impressed with Commander John Baker, Lieutenant Colonel John Com Baker, he's the commander of the Jetty and his Corps and to see how government can work uh, intergovernment uh, was really quite, uh, quite in enlightening to me and I, it's, I hope it sets a standard for what we can follow. Um, uh, on the 8th I met with Oceanfront Lodge ownership and was very excited to learn of the new restaurant which the uh, <clears throat> former Hampton Inn, the Ocean Rent Lodge, will be developing. Very exciting news there. Saturday, attended the Portuguese dinner at St. Joseph's Church. The fundraiser was quickly uh, moved toward success in raising money to build um, the ADA requirements to build bathrooms in the new gymnasium. On the uh, 
13th attended an intergovernment relations committee here at the uh, Flynn Center. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was at the city, Crescent City Wastewater uh, Water Treatment Conference Room. Uh, Visitors Bureau, we had a workshop at the home of Chris Howard in Hayuchi. We'll have some uh, reports to give you in subsequent weeks on that. Uh, Wednesday, juvenile justice and delinquency prevention at the courthouse. Uh, Valentine's Day, the Redwood Coast Transit meeting, that was on the 14th. Uh, we elected some new officers there, and uh, I've been doing some, wanted to do something I haven't done for a long time. I joined the National Rifle Association, very proud to say. Outside of that, it was a quiet three weeks. Thank you. Supervisor Hammingson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I attended the NORTEC uh, meeting in Reading, um, where we, along with our regular uh, budget uh, business, uh, had a presentation uh, uh, about uh, health occupations uh, on the north coastal counties and the northern uh, uh, inland counties uh, uh, in California. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, see those uh, uh, studies, uh, you can uh, go onto the website www.coe.cc, or excuse me, coe ccc.net slash forward slash health. Uh, pretty interesting information um, in the uh, uh, in the health uh, employment uh, uh, area. Uh, it includes uh, certified nurse assistants, clinical lab scientists, a whole uh, myriad of, of occupations uh, in the health industry. Tells you the employment, the new job growth, uh, replacement jobs, uh, all kinds of in interesting information. Uh, uh, it's kind of kind of neat to see where Del Mar County is in that uh, uh, in that information. Um, had a couple of meetings with the constituent and staff on some permitting issues. Got those resolved. Um, it was nice to do that. Hopefully that works out well. Uh, Supervisor Sullivan and I had a two by two uh, meeting with the city to. Uh, put together the agenda for the upcoming city county meeting. Um, as uh, Supervisor Gitlin uh, explained, uh, we had a LAFCO meeting uh, where we had elections. Uh, we also had some certificates of appreciation for outgoing uh, uh, commissioners, uh, Leslie McNamer and Kelly Schlong, um, along with reviewing our policy, uh, our commission policy updates uh, and their budget. Um, and we are in the process of, uh, of our uh, public member recruitment. So um, hopefully we get that taken care of. Had a luncheon with, uh, along with Supervisor Sullivan uh, with Green Diamond. Um, they're planning on expanding their uh, timber operations. So we're happy to hear that. Uh, sounds like they've got some, some good plans uh, ahead. Uh, although they were in the paper on the front page this morning. So getting a little bit of kickback uh, and as uh, Supervisor Gitlin said I also attended the services for Bobby Rice uh, known him for a long time uh, left uh, this earth much too soon uh, had a border coast regional uh, airport authority meeting uh, where we're still talking about mitigation process uh, permitting um, and then after that meeting we had some staff meetings on some some mitigation uh, issues where um, I was hoping that we could use more on-site mitigation and the consultant agreed that we possibly could do that. So we're looking into that. That sounds uh, promising. Uh, had a, a Sustainable Forest Action Coalition meeting uh, in Willows. Uh, we're working uh, with uh, Chico State uh, to develop the socioeconomic study um, of the impacts uh, of the um, management or lack of management in our forests uh, that are happening now. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, you know, certainly the impacts that, uh, that Delmar County has seen with the loss of, uh, of all of its infrastructure as far as any kind of timber activities. All the mills are gone. Um, very few timber companies left in Delmar County. Um, we're also uh, continuing to look at communication issues that Delmar County evidently is not the only one that has a problem with communication with our um, with our forest uh, supervisor and district ranger. Um, we're also looking at NEPA, uh, secure rural schools, equal access to justice, 
Um, and we had a presentation from uh, an outfit in, uh, in, out of Oregon, out of Roseburg, Oregon, who, uh, who's called the Communities for Healthy Forests, and they are very interested in what we're doing, uh, and they wanted to let us know what they were doing, and they were hoping to join forces. So that looks, looks to be maybe a good uh, combination. Um, also had a uh, local transportation commission meeting that I was a little bit tardy to. Uh, um, but anyway, we had some discussions on combined use. Um, so we're looking at some different avenues. Evidently, that's maybe something that uh, El Tico should not be looking at, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, also, in uh, within El Tico, looking at a maybe a different accounting process and personnel. So uh, hopefully that works out. I see finally we got the lake breached after a couple of attempts. So that's looking good. And uh, probably most importantly, uh, <coughs> my granddaughter celebrated her first birthday. Nice. And uh, very exciting. Congratulations. That was it for me. All right. Supervisor McClure. Thank you. I um, am separated from my phone, which has my calendar, so I'm doing this from memory. But um, since we last met, I attended the Coastal Commission meeting in Redondo Beach. There was um, very little in relationship to the North Coast, with the exception of a um, whale tail grant that was given locally for an education program and continued uh, eradication and rehabilitation of the Talawa Dunes. I uh, attended the Historical Society meeting, Juvenile Justice, and at Juvenile Justice there was considerable uh, discussion with the sheriff about the um, problem that we're having with juveniles in relationship to drug and alcohol use and how <coughs> it, they're stymied in being able to issue arrest warrants because of the time commitment that is taken that when a juvenile is arrested for being under the influence it usually takes anywhere from four to seven hours to clear that child to be able to be held at the juvenile hall and consequently um, they're not being cited and for me it's a consequence that then we deal with later addiction and more substance abuse in the long run because we don't have the um, we don't have the means to be able to get this child into the system and to effectively uh, work with them on their on their current use of alcohol and drugs, and consequently, we end up with a bigger problem when they're 17 and 18. That we have several very young children that are um, being taken to the hospital on a weekly basis but we don't have the means to address it. So I'm hoping that from this there will be a discussion that will follow on with, within the educational system on how to start to address the issues of our young people and their substance abuse. Um, I also attended the grand opening of the Wild Rivers Market and it's greatly appreciated that they're there and I also attended a um, weekend event at Open Air Farms of Ocean Air Farms with their um, stand and that was very exciting because I think that when we see local people producing food and businesses growing that way that that to me are businesses that need to be recognized as outstanding within our community and they're doing an absolutely horrific uh, wonderful job. The legal information con con continues to mount with Sutter Coast Hospital we're still trying to figure out how to get the local board to understand the need of local control. There, I think there might be some stuff on the horizon, but it's uh, right now still within the courts and within maneuvering of attempting to deal with this giant corporation on how they treat our community. I attended the airport uh, meeting that talked about the mitigation possibilities. I also um, have had the honor to see the um, plans for the new Masonic Lodge and that we recognize that that's going to be rebuilt and we are going to have a new building in our community which is exciting and it's going to have a great uh, place where 
community events can be held with a modernized kitchen and a reception hall. So I'm excited to see that the Masons are taking that uh, this opportunity to make sure that we continue to have that kind of facility in our community. I'd like to recognize that John Woolley, who has been a former supervisor in Humboldt County and has been an aide to West Chesbro, is retiring. He will be sorely missed. I spent years with him sitting on the bench, even though he was from Sunnybrae and we were from Del Norte County cheering on basketball games. But he has been just a stellar member of our region in, in making sure that our needs are taken to the state and he will be sorely missed. And it's my understanding that Wes will be, uh, West Chesbro will be in the district in late April. And I'm hoping that we can get him up here to address any concerns that we may have. And um, I missed my meeting with um, uh, Congressman Huffman's staff and hopefully we can, he's gonna come back into the district, his staff person, and that we can talk to him about the issues of um, Rowdy Creek fish hatchery and um, see if there's some way that the county can be of, ass of assistance to making sure that the hatchery is able to stay open and alive. And that's pretty much all I can remember from my, my memory bank without my assistance of my smartphone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Supervisor Finnegan. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I also had a couple of meetings over the past couple of weeks. Started off with a first five state association meeting. Um, met with the state association as well as representatives from all 58 counties and, and uh, their directors. And they asked me to speak to them on behalf of um, uh, my role as a CSAC president and what I was thinking when I asked for support for making it the year of the child and what would go into that. And talk mainly about partnerships and how first five could help uh, with the uh, different county boards of supervisors and uh, uh, asking that question just basically, how are the children? Uh, focusing on that. Uh, went well, had a CSAC call, uh, setting up agendas with the officers, had a UROC two by two meeting, talked about everything from economic development for what their plans are in the town site to some recent court cases and, and as well as to open the door for negotiating the off reservation impacts for their proposed new casino, um, had a meeting with corporate associates from the state association, and the focus really was on what um, the link between corporate associates and corporate California and corporate America and the counties and how they benefit it. And one of the individuals that I got to spend a lot of time with uh, was Russ Gould, who was the finance director under uh, Pete Wilson's administration. But he also sits on, not as a board of trustee for the California State um, University System, but he also is on the uh, California Endowment Board. And uh, so we talked about building healthy communities, investing in communities, uh, and I'm not, uh, anyway, uh, as you all know, Del Norte County is receiving approximately $10 million over 10 years towards that end. So that was a good connection. Had a meet the airport authority, JPA, uh, has already been mentioned. Uh, we also talked about uh, mitigation in the meeting with staff afterwards, was also mentioned. Had a redevelopment agency wrap up uh, or oversight committee meeting, uh, which was brief and good, and hopefully become briefer and better. <laughs> um, had a first five uh, meeting where we talked about some of the direction that our local first five wants to take and uh, uh, dreaming some more in, in, in new partnerships as well as enhancing the old ones. I was invited to speak to the grand jury on some issues uh, and then also had a um, uh, CSAC uh, call, the State Association call with the uh, Health and Human Services um, uh, oh, division or, uh, regarding the Affordable Care Act and the implementation and how that's going to take place, whether it's going to be the state model, whether it's going to be the county model, or whether it's going to be a hybrid. And we agreed on some principles, and we're going to be taking an action on this uh, again in, um, uh, on this coming Thursday. And aside from that, it was basically just talking to constituents. Everything from how horrible the road is to Klamath, even though they paved it, they can't seem to get it striped. They can't seem to get it shored up in places where they filled in time after time after time. Uh, you know, it's like uh, 
It's confusing. They can't stop slides. They just, they, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. So these are the same ones they've been working on for years. Um, anyway, it's uh, very disconcerting. So Mike, Nick, at your next meeting with Charlie the Fielder down there, would you, at the deal committee, let them know that we're not happy at all uh, with the, the road to Klamath uh, and vice versa to Crescent City. And then also just talking about constituents and everything regarding blight, regarding drug use, uh, and some of the neighborhood watches are doing some great work, especially the ones out Parkway. So um, I would ask communities that don't and neighborhoods that don't employ the neighborhood watch program to look into it. And if you need some help along that line, give us a call. All right. Thank you. Um, we have on that same note, Don, last chance grade, I, I, I think we've coined the phrase Confusion Hill 2 because <laughs> we've had so many slides and it's an active slide. That's the problem is it needs to be realigned and away from the coast there. Um, and I know they are, uh, Charlie had mentioned, they are beginning to go back to do the accounting of how much money they've poured into that road. And at a certain point, there is a break even point of saying, let's just realign the thing and, and uh, get it off the slide. So uh, I know that's been an active uh, conversation that we've, we've had. Um, just for the, those of you in the audience and also those of you watching on, on TV, um, one of the things you'll notice that each of us, you know, probably spoke at probably five to ten minutes um, because as these, especially pushing a meeting out for a week, you see the number of meetings and calls and trips and everything that, that you, you, we actively do as supervisors on the board. It's important to note that it doesn't stop. It just piles up. So that's the explanation for as long of a winded presentation as each of us have had. There's a lot of activity going on. So each of the supervisors put a lot of work into the board and, and it requires a lot of work. So um, I uh, attended a meeting uh, regarding borrow um, and probation, and we're going to have a follow-up meeting. Uh, hopefully some, some things can be resolved in terms of uh, some stuff that's going out there. And um, I, th I think we had a pretty productive meeting. Um, and we're, uh, I think uh, the Neighbors Association going forward will, um, I think we'll, we'll have a pretty good relationship uh, and communication being the key. Um, met with uh, CDD staff and Fish and Game regarding Morrison Creek flooding. Um, we are looking at different avenues of what can be done on there. There's a lot of gravel that has just built up on both sides of the road if you're out in Smith River. And so it doesn't, the water, when, it, when we have major raining, uh, major rains, uh, it, the water doesn't have anywhere to go except onto the road as well as, as flooding some individuals' homes. So we really want to work towards some type of solution on that before we hit a really heavy uh, rain again. Uh, attended the uh, film commission meeting uh, because Tri-Agency is kind of in limbo right now. Um, the, uh, I, I went uh, as well as Jeff Palmer from the Visitor Bureau and they're putting together now a map of the stars which basically means in Humboldt and Del Norte folks can get a map and seeing where these things were filmed, where, the, you know, Return of the Jedi was filmed, where uh, uh, down in Humboldt County where uh, th they've had a couple new films come out that have been filmed. But it's, it's for those folks that are really into that, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to get them and, and uh, go to visit different places in Del Norte. And uh, we're hoping at some point we're going to have a weatherproof marker so they can see where, where the item actually took place. Um, so some real, po Cassandra um, is uh, the director there and she's very enthusiastic and very, very involved. So um, it was interesting to, to attend that meeting. Um, they had uh, a couple different, uh, another supervisor, uh, Virginia Bass was there as well as uh, some city council people from uh, the Humboldt County area. Um, uh, had a two by two meeting with Supervisor Hemmingson regarding setting the uh, city county meeting uh, agenda. Also had a meeting with Supervisor Hemmingson and, and CAO at uh, Serena in regards to uh, Green Diamond's involvement in the community and uh, they are becoming, uh, their, their timber harvesting is going to begin to increase just because of the, the, the age of the stands up here. Um, they've been in Humboldt County actively involved for a while. Now it's transitioning in Del Norte just because of the age of the, of the stands of trees. Um, and actually some good news, there was, a, they hired a local um, kid, uh, Chad kid, adult, uh, Chad Freeman is going to be now working for Green Diamond here and those of you knew, uh, you know, the Freeman family and, and Chad playing uh, football Del Norte High, it's always nice to see a local kid come back and that's the example of what we want to do to be able to attract people back here. So that was really good news. Uh, attended, a, attended a tri-agency meeting. Attended uh, Bobby Rice's uh, funeral services. Um, the church was packed. 
um, if there's any indication the significance that person is to the community attend their uh, look at how many people attend their services so um, we uh, are really going to miss uh, having Bobby in the community and uh, we wish we wish his family well also um, attended a Republican Central Committee meeting uh, had a uh, meeting with the Army Corps Army Corps of Engineers and and city representatives re regarding the Jedi uh, Jetty the Jedi <laughs> Jetty and I want to thank Supervisor Gitlin for setting up that meeting that actually went really well uh, we had Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Baker come up uh, a younger gentleman who stepped into the role um, and is uh, very active uh, we were glad to see the enthusiasm there really wasn't a bureaucracy uh, type meeting it was more what can we do and there really wasn't uh, it didn't get um, it could have been gotten really complicated and it it didn't so um, I think I think it went really well so I want to thank you for putting that together uh, attended the attended the chamber mixer for the Del Norte Tennis Association uh, at the fairgrounds uh, freezing <laughs> but it was really well attended and uh, the different members of the tennis association is pretty cool to we've all talked about we need indoor facilities for Delaware County especially and I think the tennis association has done a phenomenal job uh, job putting that together Jane Rumiano had had called me up to she's actively involved I know Carolyn Westbrook's involved um, a lot of in, uh, a lot of people enthusiastically there it's nice to see a different sport uh, in in Delaware County um, had a lot of conversations regarding the fish hatchery, uh, Rowdy Creek fish hatchery. Um, had a conversation with Jim Wabo, who's the president of the hatchery board. The hatchery board has morphed now. Smith River Rancheria now is actively, um, they are five members of the nine members on that board are from the Smith River Rancheria. Uh, the, uh, I know that the tribe is very actively involved to try and keep that, because uh, it's the last privately run fish hatchery on the west coast. And um, 40, 48. In the 48 states and so we want to make sure that continues to happen one of the things that did come up about three years ago uh, Fish and Game moved the location of where they could introduce the fish uh, the hatchery fish and not really with any science behind it so we want to see what it would take to get the fish uh, the fish dumped at the forks further up up the up the river because people do want to be able to keep fish well if you're only putting them at the boat ramp that doesn't really give an opportunity for people to, to catch a lot of fish at that point um, so that's going to be an ongoing uh, uh, deal that we're coming up with uh, and going to be dealing with. Also had a lot of conversations regarding, as well as Supervisor McClure, regarding Setter Coast. Setter Coast is, uh, this is really a lightning rod in Delaware County. Um, gotten a lot of articles from different people that have just called me up out of the blue and said, I've got an article on Setter Coast regarding the involvement in San Francisco and some of these other places they have been involved. So we want to make sure... For those of you that, that are not aware, the board is actively involved in making sure that we retain a full service hospital here. So that, uh, unless anyone else on the board disagrees, that's the direction that the board has been going in. So I don't want you to think we're, we're out, uh, not involved in that because we are actively involved in that. And we do appreciate the phone calls and, and emails because uh, we want to, uh, any feedback we can get from constituents is, sometimes it doesn't always feel like it, but it's a good thing. So. Um, uh, attended a gender review, uh, uh, attended a local transportation commission meeting, uh, last, last chance grade came up again. Um, they are spending a lot of money. Uh, they're fixing a fix that didn't work, um, and it's an active slide. So if you ever get a chance from the air to look at last chance grade, you can see there, there's a lot of feet of pavement under the existing uh, road. That's how, I mean, it's it's actually it really is a no-brainer to fix the thing and realign it off but sometimes no-brainer doesn't always work so um, and we are um, we we've we've, uh, we've tried them before about four or five years ago we tried it we're, we're gonna attempt to have an evening meeting for the Board of Supervisors in May so if you are very proactive and, and want to make sure you attend that meeting so we can see from uh, from your attendance that that's what you want because uh, the last couple we had, we had almost nobody here. Um, and in the past, we haven't done it. And I was a big proponent to move it to evening meetings. And uh, the public didn't attend very well. So um, that's, that's something we'll let you know uh, in the next couple meetings what the date will be for that. So um, well, you might point yes. out, too, that not only is it not worked for every supervisor that's come down the pike and wanted to try it, because we all did, including myself, but it also is more costly. 
So it is has a negative impact on our budget um, by having it at night too. So if you want it at night, you better show up. Yeah. Okay, well said. Uh, Chair, but, yes. I, I just want to make a chime in on that this evening meeting. I don't think we have to do it a lot, but I think if we do it quarterly, uh, perhaps every four months and we have one evening meeting and we pro pro appropriately let the folks know that, give that opportunity for everyone to have a reach into government. And here we are during the business day. I'm sure there are people who would like to be here at camp because they have to work. It's economics. So I think if we look at this as a situation where once a quarter we have an evening meeting, maybe this, the, the second uh, meeting of the month, maybe we could start that in May or something like that, and they do it every quarterly from that point, that might uh, be sufficient and not too costly. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're, like I said, if, if you really want them, make sure you show up for that meeting. Um, we, um, I think what we found in past meetings of, of why it's been in the day is if it's a controversial issue, people will show. Um, but I'm absolutely, I agree. It's, we need to continue to offer that as an opportunity for people to attend. We'll do an evening meeting. The more public input, the better. So if, if I know a lot of working class folk can't make the 10 o'clock hour. So this should encourage you to come out and, and come in attendance and we'll expect the seats to be filled. Okay. At this point, Chair uh, Sullivan, can yeah. I just make one observation about uh, you're all you're stating and quite accurately. So we all went long winded by implication because we have a meeting next week. Will we all have brief reports? <laughs> uh, uh, is, a is minimum that, of words or are there or the does that a promise going? from all board members? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm working on a supervisor Finnegan. <laughs> OK, so at this point, um, we are going to uh, listen to a brief report from our, well, brief or lengthy, depending from our county administrator officer, uh, Jay Serena. I'll make it real brief. Uh, we have been working on the uh, AB 109 funding issue that uh, the jail has seen through uh, realignment. And uh, actually, there's a request before the board today for a letter, and we've also sent out a survey. Hopefully, we are the first ones to get it in, but there's a growth account out there to offset some of the the impacts financially to jails that it, it's unintended consequences but uh, we want to compete for that funding as best we can uh, we've been negotiating an ambulance contract we've had our mid-year budget meetings uh, internally and now we'll be having those with a few of the departments where there's some need um, worked on personnel issues point st george a lower looking at another extension the mitigation issues out there continue to be a bit of a problem and uh, at this point it looks like the final design for the parking lot will be finished internally if they aren't already finished uh, I saw a design on those and uh, it attempts to accommodate visitors locals private property owners uh, it looks like a pretty good design um, and as I mentioned uh, public safety realignment requests I was on a conference call it was a little bit after the actual initial e emails came out and there's a flurry of emails regarding the funding um, that was put on by the County Administrative Officers Association of California and CSAC so they're on top of it also um, there is a quite a push for that funding and I know the central counties and some of the bigger counties tend to jump in on that quicker um, and we're I think we're at the forefront with uh, ourselves and with our advocates and with CSAC okay thank you Okay, at this point, uh, since we're past the timed hour, uh, we had a timed item, um, uh, number 15 on the agenda, uh, public comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you're addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less and identify yourself into the microphone. Mr. Cochran. I'm your uh, appointed appointee to the Golden Gate Bridge District and we got some changes coming. Oh. More suicide barriers? No more tolls. No more tolls. Oh, we're getting free toll across? No. We oh. Don't risk having my name in the book. I have very few of these right now and uh, they just started passing these out. We're having uh, all electronic tolling. We've uh, had the soft rollout uh, uh, three weeks ago everything seems to be going pretty good uh, part of the the thing is uh, on all electronic tolling is that you just drive through and we're going to take a picture of your license plate we're already doing it for fast track uh, of course the state of California is 
watching very closely of how we're doing ours. And as soon as we get all the, the, uh, the equipment in place and all the programs ready, then they're more than likely going to do that on all the bridges. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, what happens, you drive across, and we're going to take a picture of your license plate. If you happen to be driving your friend's car, your friend's going to get the invoice, and you become a customer instead of a violator. And after 21 days, if you haven't paid your bill, then you become a violator. <laughs> so then it goes back to 25, then you got another, I think, another three weeks. If you don't pay it then, then it goes to 75. But anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's coming, just so you folks know that uh, uh, it's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I've been on the committee. Uh, we've had uh, the, only, the only little quirk we had, and we, got it, we think we've got it straightened out, is with the Veterans Hospital the veterans who attend uh, uh, doctor's appointments and they come across the bridge. Uh, when we had the cash toll, they get a receipt. Uh, but Cal or, or, uh, uh, Fort Miley, uh, they want, they'd like that receipt, although in some cases they, they're on the honor system, so uh, we're telling them, well, if you're on the honor system with some, why not for all? So we think we think we resolve that. Uh, we do have a bill in the legislature, SB 151, which would then put a, a number on the car when it leaves, a new car leaves the lot. That seemed to be a little stickler. Uh, and with that, then we can take the pictures. Uh, uh, the auto dealers were kind of complaining a little bit about it, but they've kind of come around. Uh, they're, they're thinking it's probably not a bad idea. We're the only state in the union that doesn't require a registration on your car when you leave. I mean, you get a little ticket on the on the windshield, but you don't get anything else. So uh, anyway, it's uh, it's been interesting, and and uh, things are moving along. So you've got it. I only have. Oh, uh, I Supervisor have just McClure. a couple of questions. On the pay by plate, it's the same fee. Uh, it's six dollars. Right, and that's oh, the. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if it's fast track, it's five. five. And, and one of the things that happened, you know, we, we had all these people come to us uh, dealing with uh, the confidentiality. And what they can do, they can go to Safeway, they can go to Walgreens, they can go to Chevron. There's different little kiosks that are around. They can buy and load a, a fast track card or, or mechanism up with dollars, and they can go across that, you know, each time, and it'll automatically take out the $6. Uh, but if they go to Fast Track, then they can go to five dollars. And but they don't want to register. They don't want to register the license plate. They want a credit card out there. So that's their their business. But we are we are surprised at the number of people who do not have checking accounts uh, in in the Bay Area. Uh, and it's really you know you surprise me. For most of us, it just you say, oh gosh, you need a checking account. No, they don't. They don't have one. So so they, it, it or a credit card. So it, it does make it a little difficult. In some cases and then how are they going to deal with recovery I understand how you'll deal with recovery for a California plate that it'll go for registration right but what are you going to do about Maine the Maine or Idaho or we, we, we have a reciprocal agreement already with 13 states around California uh, the other states uh, uh, we've had dealings with Illinois for an example uh, they're very very congenial they they accept our our uh, charge, they contact their, their uh, uh, resident and then in turn uh, put a lien against their, their <coughs> license plate, the re-registration. Re and you gotta remember, if you drive your mother's car, she's gonna get the, get the bill. So, That's what I'm doing. So, That's yeah, right. yeah, I know, Jerry, Jerry's into that. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, uh, it, it is a, a, a good yeah. program. Uh, It'll and rental cars? Rental cars, we, we've got agreements with all of the na national rental car companies. So, I mean, it, you know, we've, we've really worked at it to get it get it down. And that, once we do, like I say, then the state of California will start the whole moving that. You, you look at the Bay Bridge, you know, you up to a half hour wait to get across the Bay Bridge in the morning. The only time we're uh, impacted is the, the Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon returnees to the city, they got the cash. They get into line, and you have a backup on the bridge. Uh, we hope to eliminate that. I mean, that, uh, there should be no reason to have that. So anyway, uh, we have about uh, 
uh, 35,000 cars a day that go across there that do not have fast track or, or, or now they can start signing up for the uh, license plate account if they'd like, but uh, they don't necessarily have to. So anyway, Jerry? Um, yeah, is there, you don't have to be a frequent flyer or anything. I mean, fast track, I mean, you use you it just, once a year, once every other year, it's not a big mostly, deal. Mostly what happens from Crescent City, I get the calls from uh, our, your constituents saying, hey, can you fix my ticket for my <laughs> citation? And I said, no, I can't. Uh, um, so what, uh, what happens, they, they get in the wrong lane now, and, and they're too far over on the left to get back into the cash lane, so they go through the fast track. And uh, there are provisions already to, to be able to pay for that. Uh, you can go to, you can come back into the sergeant's office, but now there's no need. Everyone becomes a customer, so it'll, it'll be a, an interesting interesting time and we hope to roll it out uh, the end of March as if we have any real glitches then we'll we'll hold off but uh, we seem to have covered all of the all the bases so Roger Jerry uh, so this is all and some folks are gonna lose their jobs is what you're phasing out yeah. employment all right and eventually during this period of time there is a transition but you know again someone like me I'm not a frequent user of the Bay Area, of the Bay Bridge or actually the Golden Gate Gold Bridge um, it sounds like this is going to be something that's, if it's successful, it'll be implemented throughout the other districts, uh, and I would suggest that it would be. But there's so much tourism that goes in and out of San Francisco. Uh, someone like me, what do I do if I'm going to go into San Francisco? Do I need to prepare for this and say I need to go to Walgreens or I need no. to go to, and get the fast track? No. Once this is implemented, what's the protocol? You just, if, if you're, if you, the first time back in the Bay Area after April 1st, you just drive down and it's, it's gonna give you a sign, keep moving, keep moving, don't stop. Uh, and so you just go on through and oh, okay, no problem. And then and within three days or thereabouts, they're gonna send, send an invoice to your home mm -hmm. or to the registered owner's home uh, to pay the bill, mm -hmm. the $6. And you'll, it's a nice letter, it's not a nasty letter. Now, uh, the, the, earlier you, you had mentioned the employees, we had uh, a total of 33 toll takers, 28 full-time and five fill-ins. Uh, we're down to 15 uh, original toll takers. Six of those people are gonna retire. The other people have either left or we've placed them into other positions within, within the organization. A couple become bus drivers. Uh, uh, one lady uh, ended up going to be a, a, in maintenance in, in the buses. Uh, one lady went to to uh, the paint shop. She's a now a painter on the bridge. So we 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 give them priority on the on the system. After after we click the switch, the last eight. Now we we've been telling them for two years to keep applying, and the eight that that we think are there haven't applied at all for nothing that that we've uh, come up with any any of the other jobs, and. Uh, uh, some of them will go someplace else in another uh, another uh, line of work, uh, but we will give them uh, a severance package uh, if they if they want to stay on the priority list up to a year. Uh, they'll get one one type of package, and then they, there's an enhanced package if they're just going to walk away. You know, if they're and, and a couple of them a couple of them were bridging. Uh, they're within. Uh, two years for their health insurance, so we're bridging that time to to give them <coughs> health insurance, uh, so they can they could actually retire. Uh, in, in and Jerry, no change. It's a strictly unidirectional uh, scan of the card. You're not going both ways. This thing. No, just the one way. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Yeah, they right. did. They <laughs> they did that in 19, <laughs> 1974. Right. They, they were the first bridge in the nation to do that. Boy, you, you're talking about these fees. Uh, I went to San Francisco State for 1967. It's 25 cents each direction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> extrapolate that out to current figures at six dollars and hold your breath. Oh, that's six dollars. Still a good deal. Yeah. You know, uh, in our retrofit so far, uh, we're uh, we're at uh, 350 million. It cost us 35 million to build the bridge. So I mean, you you start thinking about. You know the the difference. Well, it was 37 when they opened it, but the forethought of our fathers uh, uh, certainly helped us to build that. So anyway, any other questions, comments? 
Well, thank you very hey, much. Hey, thanks for the update. Right. Appreciate the work you do, Jerry. Okay, any other public comment? Okay, seeing no public comment, I'm going to close oh, the public. Hold on a second. Comments, Ms. Sir. Jones, did you have some comments that you want to make that you came here for? No, that he was just in public comments. So this is general public. Is there anyone with, with public comments? Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Harm Jones, and I think Martha knows me. Yeah, retired teacher for like 43 years, science teacher. And I like to talk a minute, and I'll come back. I like to give them a little bit of my background, why I think this. Mr. Jones, too, I, I can just remind you, you got three minutes as your total okay, public I'll, comment, I'll, so I'll just be aware of that. Okay. Uh, on the corner of K and 5th Street, there's a middle uh, place. Halfway house. Halfway house, right. Okay. Um, when I got out of this service, I went to um, college in Tacoma, and I worked at night at the American Lake Veterans Hospital for the mentally ill. And that was no, a place of no crime. The little town of Stillicum right next to it, my father-in-law was the constable and only one person, a law officer in that big town. So the people that were allowed out, we didn't have to worry too much about them. But where they are down here is the worst place in town for safety. I would not want anyone to walk behind the Safeway store alone. Everybody knows that. It's a bad place. And I, I worry about that location for these people that have problems. Being so close to a place where there's people that are coming and going, transits, where it's dangerous. So that's my... So we, would, we own a house on 5th and K, the corner of 5th and K. You can speak into the microphone a little. We, we own a house on the corner of 5th and K, and we are concerned about the halfway house that is uh, opposite us, that has just opened up there. It's not supervised. Uh, nobody uh, really uh, consulted us before um, this was implemented. And um, uh, we're worried about quite a few things that might uh, fall out from there. Uh, we've had problems before with, um, we live on 6th and J, with, um, when there was a, a, a drug place on between 6th and 7th on J Street. We've had some problems and we're worried about any problems that might um, occur in this place, in this residence. Um, this uh, house apparently is not supervised. There are, um, I understand there are three people there. And um, it, does, it is called for concern for those of us living in the neighborhood. Are there really only two houses? But. Okay. Any Supervisor Gitlin. Well, you know, this was brought up at the consent agenda when we pulled this item out, having to do with the signing of this lease. As you are aware, I, I had yes, you uh, informed us. I'd asked you about that before, and it, it just it. I am I share your concern. It does concern me. It troubles me that there is no monitoring of of people who have psychological or psychiatric needs and they're living in the neighborhood. And this followed an event where uh, some mentally ill person was stabbing a, the ATM machine at Chase yes. Bank. So this was fresh on my mind. Plus the fact that there's, there's no understanding of any, any, any understanding of gender mixing, where you have three uh, uh, beds there. And you know again, you could have two males and one female. It, it becomes instantly problematic. And I, I caution the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, that to closely monitor this and closely wander, monitor their gender mixing because it, not if, it will have impact on the neighborhood. Yes. And I do share your concern. Yes. I brought that up when we pulled this from the consent agenda. The lease, as you know, has been approved. Yes. And we're hoping that um, these, these issues that you are bringing up are not going to come to reality. So I'm, I'm hoping that Health and Human Services uh, reevaluates its monitoring of this particular property uh, and is considerate of the neighbors uh, that surround it. Thank you. Mr. And Mr. Jones, uh, because it is public comment period, where we've got to allow um, just for the meeting time. Um, have you approached uh, Director Blacknick at all? No, I haven't. No. Okay, I, I would suggest because he is the department head to to approach him, uh, especially if any complaints come up. But I would go to him directly to to voice your concerns on that. Uh, I see. Rather than go to the police, go straight. To yeah, the I would go go to Director Blacknick. You know, if you've got concerns from the beginning, that that he is the department head. That's his job. 
Um, I, I would talk to him about it and, and voice your concerns. And then obviously uh, you do have an advocate on the board for you in, in that respect. Uh, with Supervisor Gitlin, it's an important issue with him. So, uh, but I would start with Director uh, Blatnick. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Any, any other public comment? Hi, my name is Patty Vernelson. I'm the director of First Five Del Norte, and I know you're behind schedule. I just want to thank Supervisor Finnegan for bringing up Year of the Child here and also at CSAC at the executive board. Um, everyone's very excited about working with him and really talking about children. Um, and thank you to all of you for your hard work um, because that's what we're all working on. Congratulations on your one-year-old baby. Since I came to you, I now have a second grandchild who's three months old. Congratulations. So that sort of makes what um, uh, David's talking about even more important to me personally. But um, thank you. All right. Thanks, Patty. Any other public comment? Yes. Christine. Um, yes, again, I had to just come in on behalf of CASA of Del Nor, and I'm also on the Child Abuse Prevention Council. And uh, just say thank you to David Finnegan for um, making sure that the public knows how important children are in our community. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Chris twice here, okay. Well, uh, this is not the David Finnegan fan club, but we are really, <laughs> we are really, really um, delighted that you have put children again on the agenda for not just our county, but for the um, entire state. and. Um, and also, as your appointee to the local child care planning council, uh, I know that the council is behind the proclamation and the effort and focus on early child development. We know that we have to work from zero on up. All right. Thank you. Any any other public comment? Any other Dave fans that would like to speak on the? All right. Okay, so uh, we are going to go to the consent agenda so we can actually pass that resolution that's on the consent agenda. Supervisor Hemmings. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we got Zach coming up here. Uh, we'll take the consent agenda. So move to approve. Any any corrections on? I would. I will second, but I would like to pull number seven for discussion. Okay. Any public comment on the consent agenda? Uh, minus number seven, which we're going to discuss. Okay, uh, Tony, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor Heming Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Okay, it's been moved to approve. At this point, we're going to take our other time item, which was at 1030. Mike, if I could, yes. can I just read the resolution real oh. quickly? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, it's a, anyway, just very briefly. Um, after, after the presentation. I know that we did a year of the child probably five, six, seven years ago, and um, uh, being the president of CSAC, I was asked, what are you going to do this year? And I thought it would be a great idea to try and use that bully pulpit, if you will, to uh, make the year of the child throughout the state, uh, especially in light of AB 109, especially of Prop 30, uh, the new realignment with health and welfare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm asking CSAC on Thursday to pass the resolution, and then each and every county in the state will also be asked to pass the resolution. Del Norte will be the first, or is yeah. the first. David. Uh, resolution yeah, of yeah. Um, and I apologize because I meant to pull this to talk about it too, and, and I was curious on why it's not the deca decade of the child or the. You know, because I, I they would say I was trying to stay at CSAC for ten years, years instead yeah. of one. <laughs> and, <laughs> Probably I don't know, um, but I, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's know, just what <laughs> what we're asking. We got a long I got a long ways to go before my granddaughter becomes. 18. Well, then it needs yeah exactly. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, and I, I did mean to bring, bring that up also. That, and, and I don't have a problem with it being the year of the child and continuing a year of the child every year. Um, it's fine with me, but uh, I'd like to thank you, David, for all your work on this. Well, thank and you. And I'll be Great. part of the David Finnegan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, could, part of it is, is you needing to ask the question of just uh, everything that we do. Uh, how does it affect the children? And so we've challenged the governor. We've challenged the legislature. I reported to you last time that... Now, economic development, uh, according to Steinberg, is not just a storefront. Economic development is how we, is infrastructure, and part of that infrastructure is our children. It's how we educate them. It's it's uh, how you know the, the support, the partnership. So, two things: one is uh, recognizing the partnerships, and the second thing is providing the focus is how are the children 
and how does it affect the children and everything we do. So the resolution of the County of Del Norte Board of Supervisors declaring 2013 is the year of the child. Whereas California is home to 9.5 million children from infants and toddlers to school agers and teens. And whereas these children are the future of our state with our investment in our children of today representing our investment in the working people, community leaders, parents and problem solvers of tomorrow. And whereas it is therefore imperative that the elected officials, community leaders and policymakers of today prioritize California's children and consider the impact of each decision they make on all of our children today, tomorrow, and in the future. Whereas the California voters approved Prop 10 in 1998, investing first five California and 58 county first five commissions with responsibility to lead communities in expanding early developmental and school readiness services and improving systems for children ages zero to five and their families. And whereas each first five commission works in partnership with the County Board of Supervisors as well as other public and nonprofit agencies to address the needs of young children and their families. And whereas California counties share this dedication to the good health, school readiness, general well-being of our children who cannot vote, lobby or advocate and are dependent on the adults of today for their well-being. And whereas the President of the California State Association of Counties has challenged his colleagues to ask how are the children and to always consider what is best for the children and to continue focusing on the children until we can say with confidence all the children are well. Now therefore be it resolved that the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors joins elected officials across the state, first five commissions and their many community partners in recognizing the critical importance of placing children at the core of our plans, at the heart of our purpose, and at the top of every agenda as we, we proclaim uh, 2013 as the year of the child passed and adopted. And I want to recognize again uh, child care, first five, CASA, and all the other partners. So, and it, everybody from Little League, foster parent associations, all throughout the community. So thank, thank you, you, Supervisor Finnegan. Um, we are, um, at, at this point, we're going to go to our, actually, we'll, we'll take number seven up, and then we'll do uh, California Coast, and then Zach here. <laughs> You'll be right after that, so. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that I recognized Heidi and uh, her staff, I think. Who else helped? Randy. With Randy. Considerably. That I think that they did an, uh, a stellar job oh, in, I agree. in taking a look at this. Thank you. My only exception is in the second paragraph of the summary, okay. I'm concerned that the, um, the topic moves away from strategic planning mm -hmm. to an actual very large issue that we have in relationship to our county and the commission. And I would suggest that that paragraph be turned into a standalone letter so it's not lost in relationship to strategic planning. Um, other than that, I think that you did an outrageous job and thank you for your hard work. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. And, and, and I have to agree. I, when I was reading this letter, I'm going, wow, does that hit the, I mean, for them, from the point of them taking guidelines and making it law um, to, to the, uh, to, to the point of interpretations on, on how they're, uh, from staff to staff, the interpretations change uh, and, and somehow the guidelines get morphed into things that, that the original act had no intentions of, of doing uh, whatsoever. Um, excellent job. I got to give you great kudos. Uh, whoever worked on it, Heidi, I know you did. And Randy and, was a and, huge, huge help. I, I just, so. I think it was absolutely outstanding. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from supervisors? Well, apparently Heidi still loves going before the Coastal Commission <laughs> testifying. <laughs> I love it. It's fun. <clears throat> Good, Good job. Punishment. Thank you. So, our, well, I don't know if the rest of the, the board is in support any, of any making this we a standalone it? letter or making, just letting it ride. I'm, I'm concerned that these issues will be um, uh, not because they are not in relationship to the strategic plan, I, I they may that. not carry, they may not be as weighty as we would like them to be. Yeah, I, I knew it was outside of the context of what they were asking for, but as staff, we hear comments from the board and from the public and tried to find some place to squeeze it in. Yeah, so I, I get it's it in a why separate it's letter, there. I'm just suggesting that you may not want it there just because you want it to carry a, a stronger punch. I think I would be inclined to leave it there, but also follow up a letter, a letter also, because I, I think I hammering. No the I would agree. Issue.
That's so right. is there Your a argument? Motion? It's it's complete. Heidi, you did a good job, and you know it's a delicate balance. We're trying to ascertain our rights here in the county, and California Coastal Commission has uh, a, a wide range of authority. So uh, we're, it's good that you're speaking up on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion then? I'll, I'll, I'll issue a motion on that. Oh, we have the motion to approve. Yeah, yeah. move to approve, approve the letter and send a, a subsequent letter with that summary data. So it's also. been moved, and well, Supervisor Gitlin will be on the second on that. Right. So, um, any public comment? Okay, seeing no public comment, uh, Tony, could you pull the vote, please? Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Well, well done, Heidi. And Randy. So, um, at this point, we will take our 10:30 timed item, uh, which is the Ditson Project update by Zach Larson. Zach, come on up. This is my con. to put together some funding, as you know, to uh, keep the sonar station in the water, so to speak, uh, in the Smith River at, at River Mile 6. Um, we have some new project partners uh, that you're aware of, and they're up on the board. And um, so we're, we're really having to really scratch around to look for funding for this program. We recently submitted a three-year uh, project proposal to the Department of Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Restoration Grants Program. I just found out that was denied. And the reason it was denied is because um, the state priorities now, particularly in our region, are on coho salmon. And this study focuses on salmon, and, or Chinook salmon and steelhead. Um, our project is located, uh, like I said, off of Fred Haight Drive in Smith River, near the town of Smith River, at River Mile 6. Um, our objectives are to estimate the basin-wide abundance of anadromous fish in the, in the river uh, and monitor the sal salmon and steelhead status and trends and uh, hopefully inform fishery management decisions at the state and federal levels. Um, just to remind you, uh, DITSON is just an acronym for the technology. Um, it has uh, a lot of advantages over conventional fisheries techniques and it can see fish in dark and muddy waters during nighttime 24-7. Um, this is a, a slide showing the views or w what's going on with the uh, technology. We currently use a system that uses 48 beams and as fish swim through those beams it creates video type images that you can record, play back, slow down and uh, further analyze through the software. Um, our station is set up um, in a large portion of the, of the Smith River, uh, an area that's constricted uh, that allows us to get maximum coverage. Um, and this is a conceptual view of what it looks like. Um, the triangles are there to represent the beams of coverage. And of course, the river level changes, particularly on the Smith River with all the rain we get. And so you get, uh, sometimes we don't cover the center of the channel, but what we're finding is that, particularly during steelhead season, it's the fish favor the banks, as a lot of fishermen know. Um, and here's just a video just to kind of let you see what we see. Um, and this is sped up like 25 times, and I don't think this is coming across very well on the screen, but you can see, you can actually see the tail beats of fish the entire um, uh, fish itself, and you can stop and measure that individual. So it's not rocket science when you, to, in the analysis um, aspect of it, uh, but there are some, some uh, challenging parts of an ana and now analyzing the data. 
But this is basically what you see. This is recorded um, during steelhead run times that goes out to 23 meters. Uh, and you get this, the output is <coughs> as if you're hanging out over the river looking straight down. And so at two meters, that's right next to the bank and out at 20 meters is out more in the center of the channel. So here's some comparison results, and I think they're very strong to represent what's going on in the Smith River. Um, here's our two-year pilot study, and these are cumulative counts that we've made of fish going upstream in the Smith. And um, it may not be easy to, to visualize what's going on here, but this is as the run builds, and the red, is, uh, the red and blue uh, lines are the two years of study. And they're very similar. And um, you can see on the left, that depicts the numbers of fish that we count and then date on the bottom. And 2010 and 2011 were very similar. This does not account for the, the hatchery data, the fish that go up Browdy Creek. And there are circumstances that we miss some fish. But this is, in general, very close, I think, to what is happening in the Smith River. Um, and this is at a minimum. These are counts, not estimates, and they are, um, there's more fish. Um, we've taken the Rowdy Creek fish hatchery data, uh, thanks to Rowdy Creek for providing us um, this data every year. And you can see here, this is a little more confusing, but what it shows is that uh, there is some overlap between Chinook salmon and steelhead, but around mid-December is when um, the Chinook stop showing and the steelhead um, begin their peak migration. Um, and you can see in the, in the green, which corresponds to the left axis, uh, that is our Ditson count. And the colored blocks correspond to the uh, right axis. And uh, they line up quite well. Uh, the spikes in Chinook at the hatchery line up with our spike counts and from Ditson and, and same with Steelhead. And so this, this creates a, a, a one of our difficulties in parsing out or apportioning species um, during the year because we can't definitively determine what's a Chinook and what's a Steelhead other than based on size. And so here's this, there's a, some plateaus in the um, first two years of data that, that uh, allows us to help differentiate between Chinook and salmon. And you can see everything on the left, um, in, not everything, but a good portion of the fish on the left are Chinook and uh, on the right side of the screen are steelhead. And you can see little spikes in um, numbers counted. And those are from, in Chinook run times, we've had over 1,000 fish a day coming up. And in Steelhead, we've had over 500 fish a day come up. But in general, um, Steelhead are, uh, there appears to be a, just a few less Steelhead than Chinook in these last two years. And here's, here's separating that information out. I don't know how easy that is to really see what happened there, but um, what I'm trying to show here is this is great information to let us know what happens year to year. And that's what monitoring status and trends is for. And if we have a, a crash, you, it would stand out in the data, or if you have an amazing run, it would also stand out in the data. Um, currently, we don't have this kind of information. Um, so for 2013, um, we were only funded for steelhead run times, and uh, I think we're building a really good data set. And uh, steelhead are a little more clear to understand what's going on than Chinook. Chinook tend to hang out more in the lower river and mill, and steelhead just seem to be on the move. Um, there are some steelhead that, that move downstream, and it's part of their life history. They, after they spawn, they actually come and, and uh, migrate back downstream. And so that sh also shows up in our data. Uh, but you can see these spikes in, in counts of fish. Um, 
at times that uh, when there's good fishing. Um, so here's, here's a comparison between these three years um, that we've done, and this is just for steelhead that we're saying from December 15th uh, to the present, and this has ended on February 9th. Uh, since this time, we've had uh, about 500 fish moving upstream in the last 10 days, and uh, this year appears to be, um, steelhead appear to be less abundant um, preliminarily or on a preliminary basis um, than the previous two years. 2011 was our strong year for steelhead. 2010 was second, and this year is worst of them. But there, it's, I hate to say, use the word worst because there is only about a thousand fish separation between the three years. Um, so in general, they seem to be fairly consistent. Um, and just a general conclusion, uh, I think we're finding that this type of data is an excellent source of data for long-term monitoring for the status and trends of steelhead. Um, <coughs> NIMPS, National Marine Fisheries Service under NOAA, uh, they don't currently use Ditson because there hasn't been enough information to show that it's useful. And it's projects like ours that are going to hopefully change that. Um, every so often they review the status of steelhead see in our, our area, the Klamath Mountains province, and there's, that drives regulation changes. Um, that is, was one of the early reasons why we went to Barbless Hooks. Uh, it was with some agreements made with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I would like to uh, see this continue. We're going to continue to to search for funding, and we appreciate your support. Um, and I wanted to mention, I thought I had a slide on it. We have a local Jesse Nolan, uh, who's an outstanding worker at the Ditson Station, biologist, and uh, Ryan Nelson also has been great. So we've, we've been running like a well-oiled machine, and we invite you to come out um, and see our operation. Okay, any questions? Yeah, where's he going? Oh, wait. Where are you going, Zach? <clears throat> Where are you going? Fishing. <laughs> no, that is the 25th. <laughs> okay. Supervisor Hamming said. Um, I, I keep getting hit with this information um, that somehow this fish counting is going to affect the Rowdy Creek fish hatchery. Is there some Nexus, is there some correlation? Is there some connection between the two? I can't see it. Um, I've been asked the same thing, and um, logically, I can't really see any real connection or any influence it would have on hatcheries. Okay. The other question that, uh, that uh, certainly pops to my mind is the coho recovery plan. Um, is there is there anything in the works to dial this software in to be able to detect the difference between the coho and the Chinook and the steelhead? There have been attempts, um, and usually they look at tail beat frequency. That seems to be the um, current approach. And it's, it works for some salmonid species, but it, it may be difficult for coho and steelhead. I mean, they're approximately the same size. Um, it's, it's not there yet. But what this is, is in addition to the suite of methods that can be used. Um, I mean, we, we have, we used to have <coughs> angler surveys in the Smith that would help us parse out, you know, timing, um, uh, genetic information, uh, hatchery information, all of those things. We don't have that anymore. We have the steelhead card, which is great, and the salmon card, which is great. But we could sure use an on-the-ground angler survey to help this. And I, it would be, um, the Ditson just really makes a great contribution to the entire picture. I, I, and I don't disagree with you, um, but I was just thinking for funding, if, if you had that connection where you could differentiate or if, you, if it was part of your working plan to 
to somehow come up with a count for the coho, you might be able to find <coughs> uh, find funding maybe a little more easily since they've got this recovery plan out there. Absolutely. I, with a straight face, I couldn't say that it was, you know, it, it really fit into the coho plan. I mean, we submitted it anyway just because they also deal with salmon and steelhead. But for our region, like I mentioned, coho is the priority because they're the only listed fish we have in the right. Smith. So um, and we lose out on some funding because of that, which um, is. Um, just a couple of other little things. Um, in, your, in your first slide, um, you used the word estimate. So you're not only physically counting, but you're doing some estimations along with this? There are aspects of our program where we do estimate run sizes, um, but that, the data that I showed you were just empirical counts. Okay. And then you, you uh, had also mentioned that you would advise on management, did I, did I catch that right? Well, that, um, not advise, I think that's the wrong word. We're objective, we're counting fish, we're providing data, um, the policymakers, the public uh, has the opportunity to use that data to, to, uh, to meet whatever policy objectives are out there. Okay. Thanks, Zach. Yep. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, uh, Zach, first of all, nice, very excellent presentation. I had two questions, and, um, you know, again, I'm, um, I must tell you, I, I share Supervisor Hemmingson's concern about how the data will be used, and I understand it's your job to count fish. But it does concern me that the grantors of these three uh, grants, uh, one, two, two private and one public, um, have very clearly stated their agenda. And they don't like mixing hatchery fish with wild fish. And it, I simply am connecting the dots. So I understand that's not your position to editorialize on what they're going to do with the data. Your job is to simply count fish. But on, in relationship to that, um, you know, and again, I hear there's a slight decline in the amount of fish from year to year. Uh, can you actually um, uh, put that in a figure uh, percentage-wise of, since you've been taking the studies, of how much percentage off year to year the fish count is, two, three, five percent? We could, we could come up with that information, but in the grand scheme of things, just, I mean, um, fish populations are cyclical and you will have highs, you will have lows. And that, how close those cumulative counts are in these three years is impressive to me. Um, I would expect a little more variation in that. But, um, you know, next year, we, it's unfortunate that we weren't able to look at the salmon season. Um, but uh, we could certainly come up with percentages of difference. Well, I, I think it's important, and again, I'm, I'm particularly referring to the last graphic you showed us, which had the three colored lines of yes. three years. And each one showed a slight decline. I wasn't able to quickly look at that, just kind of do a numerator, denominator, but I don't know, maybe you could put it back up to say, is it, is, if there's a general decline in the amount of fish, I'd like to know, is it within uh, parameters that are acceptable or seasonal? And again, um, my questioning comes from a, a, a suspicion of people will use this data to say, well, the fish count is down. Uh, we need to do something about this and, and use the data in a less than um, objective manner. So that's not your concern. That's my concern as a supervisor. And I'd like to know um, what these actual numbers are and kind of peel back the onion a little bit. So if you can provide the actual numbers from date to date of what the decline is, however slight it may be, I'm, I'm gathering just by the lines looking it's somewhere in the 2 to 5% range. I'm thinking that's it. Uh, I'd like to know that. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's any decline. Um, the first year, the second year we had the most fish, most steelhead. First year we had the most salmon. Mm -hmm. This year it seems to be a, a little less for steelhead by approximately 1,000 fish based on our count. So 1,000 fish translates to what percentage? Uh, um, less than 10, okay. less than 5. And that, I would expect that kind of variation throughout the years. Right. And, and what I'm saying in terms of monitoring status and trends is you will see it, if, if there is some sharp decrease, <coughs> you will see that. It will stand out in the data. And then, then it would be time for our policy, man or our managers to take action. 
whether that fish count was super high or whether it was low. I mean, I, I'm not saying what direction that they would decide on, but it's uh, the data is there. there. Well, and the, the third question having to do with this is you've got two monitors there, one on one side of the river, one on the other. Yes. Um, are the numbers analogous? Uh, going up and coming down, are they, are they about the same, or are there fish uh, hovering around up there, sticking around? Or? Oh, I could keep you here for a long time, but the, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're, they're not, they're analogous, yes, that's in a ratio sense, but species, the Chinook and, and Steelhead, we see them acting differently. Uh, steelhead tend to, tend to favor one side of the river versus the no. other, okay. so, but Chinook, they're all over the place, so. But I'd be happy to follow All right, up. Thank you. All right. Th any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Zach. Good. Okay. We are at this point going to go on to the budget transfers item. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to accept uh, our budget transfers. Second. And that's our. It's two dash zero one, two dash zero two, two dash zero three, and two dash zero four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any public comment on the budget transfers? Okay, bringing it back to the board. Uh, Tony, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gatlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Okay, we are going to go on to item thir or 17 in the agenda, legislative and budget issues. Consider miscellane uh, miscellaneous legislative and budget matters pertinent to the County of Delaware, authorized to, to sign and send appropriate letters with respect to matters pending before the state or federal governments. Uh, uh, in Jack general Jack. terms, I'll, I'll go over 17. 18 has a direct request, and that was on the AB 109 letter okay. that uh, you were given this morning. Um, uh, the legislature seems to be kicking up now with some new bills or new proposed bills that are coming out. Um, one in particular that came out late last week uh, that we were made aware of is a, a bill similar to the Josh Lacey bill. And I've talked with our advocates and asked them to support that at this point. Um, I'll bring something forward for the next meeting specifically to see if the board wants to do that. Um, but in general terms, that's based on previous actions of the Board of Supervisors. It's, it is similar, uh, although not as all encompassing, I don't believe from the reading. Um, and as I've said, there's, there's other bills that are going to be coming forward that we'll have to take a look at that uh, the board will want to consider writing letters or sending uh, uh, forwarding information to our advocates on behalf of the county for their use. Um, but it, it appears that it's starting at this point and we'll be seeing those, I think, through the end of this fiscal year and uh, this session. Um, as far as the federal government and state government, we will be bringing forward a uh, legislative platform in the future for the board to consider. It'll be updated from last year and uh, we'll be getting information both from our federal advocates and the state uh, advocates uh, regarding any type of significant legislation or any of the legislation that the board has uh, taken on in the past and what we're anticipating coming up. And uh, just a, a refresher too, at some point, we'll bring the uh, goals and policy, or goals of the board forward. Uh, last one's just to reiterate, to bring them back to the board. Goals and policies will come through with the uh, recommended budget. Okay. And that comes, starts in April in all okay. the departments. Uh, many of the departments have goals and uh, objectives that they put together already in regards to department head sure. uh, evals, but we'll request those of all departments elected, appointed and uh, have those available as part of the recommended budget. So okay. those, are, those will be coming. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been going through the uh, preliminary figures on the mid-year budgets and projections, and we will be meeting with a few departments, and primarily on any significant issues that look like there's a decrease in revenue or there's expenditures that were uh, uh, that look like they're going to be above what the budget items were for and then meet with a couple of departments where there looks like there may be a few disconnects on how to do their mid-year budgets uh, we have staffing changes and and such that we may have to sit down and uh, do a little coaching on okay any other items legislative budget issues I yes would, I would go ahead like, Super like to um, say that we should do a, a extra careful watch because I think Friday is the drop dead date for new bills to be introduced. So 
we could be hit with a barrage of them between now and the 22nd. Well, and then Supervisor Finnegan and myself also will be down in Sacramento this, this week for CSAC board directors meetings. So um, I do have a couple meetings that I'm going to plan on doing outside of the, the board meeting, uh, fishing game being one, and, and um, a couple other meetings that uh, State Senator uh, Nielsen setting up for me. Um, Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Sullivan. Uh, you know, immigration is in the news uh, big time in this last few weeks, and Congress, as we know at this time, will be developing legislation to, to regain control of our borders, um, introduce a relevant guest worker program, and ascertain the status of those who have entered the United States illegally over this past 25 years since uh, the 1987 law. <clears throat> so I'm in support of the bipartisan the United States Senate legislation that's currently being written as we speak, and I'm asking this board to direct our federal advocates in Washington, D.C. to uh, investigate and support this legislation, and then the result would be in sending a five-signature letter to Representative Jared Huffman to support the Senate proposal. This proposal will also uh, direct our federal advocates to report back to the board on immigration legislation that is pending before both the Senate and the House. So I am proposing that at this time. Any thoughts from, I, I think we actually looked in, there isn't a bill yet per se. It's the, the initiative, there hasn't been one introduced yet. Um, yeah. um, I, I would be uh, willing to bring it back to a board once we have a bill that we're looking at. But right now it's just, okay. uh, um, uh, an initiative more than anything else, I think, at this point. Any thoughts from other supervisors? Okay, so we will. If the board requests, uh, you know, or I can go forward with talking with our federal advocate and try to get as much information on any any drafts that are coming out and uh, stay ahead in that sense and too. Forward it to the board members as, yeah. as it comes And eventually out. if I, it, uh, any reports that are needed, they can do that too. Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, realistic about that. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, when you weigh in on something while it's still being drafted, unless it's something like secure rural schools where there's an official policy of the board and it's in conformance with that, you really run the risk of losing any clout you have in discussions that take place further down the road. Because uh, there's, as you well know, and we'll learn even more about whether state and federal level the amount of kibitzing that goes on between when a bill is introduced and what it ultimately ends up looking like is something to behold. Well, Supervisor Finnegan, this is not a standalone. Uh, there are other counties that have done this in the state. And currently, uh, throughout the state, there are a number of other counties who have already They're done this. they in on a piece of legislation that hasn't been introduced? Yes, I'll, I'll give it to you if you want from Los yeah, Angeles no, no, County. Fine. We can so, talk later. you know what? I'm asking this board to investigate what's going on and the report back to us. That's what I'm in fact asking this board to do. Well, I thought, yes, nothing more, nothing something. less. Okay, so uh, at this point, Jay, if you could follow up with that and get us any information as, as the bill becomes, uh, actually, as the bill is crafted, uh, just to give us an update on where we're at with that. So, um, any other items, legislative budget matters? I think this fits under the legislative budget action, Chair Sullivan, this is regarding the invitation extended to Wayne Shell. Is that the window in which we can discuss this here? Uh, uh, you can bring it up, I think, if it's a monetary thing, we'd have to put it on the next agenda to vote. Well, and then let, let's go ahead and, do you want me to introduce it here and then we'll bring it up for the, because it will be a monetary uh, announcement. Uh, let me just open it up right here to discuss it. Uh, Wayne Shell is a retired economic advisor. Many of you know him here in Del Norte County. Um, I've spoken to him last week. Many of you have spoken to him over the time I've, I've asked him to come up and give us uh, an assessment of our economic options 2013-2014. Wayne and his associate Tim Johnson would essentially spend two to three days up here evaluating our area and at, initially they would be asking for expenses only. It kind of changed a little bit as we spoke here. They're asking for a slight honorarium. Uh, I've also spoken to the city of Crescent City and city manager um, uh, Palazzo and mayor uh, Ania, and they've indicated a willingness to split these so-called expenses. Uh, Wayne has offered to waive his uh, fees, just expenses only, so the number they were proposing was somewhere in the neighborhood of up to $4,000, which sounds like it would be less, but uh, I would like to put it on the uh, agenda if it's a monetary issue. 
uh, to discuss this on the next meeting. Okay. Well, we can add it on for discussion at the next meeting then. Um, well, any other? Is, yes. Is this something that also um, tri agency is, even though the city has chosen not to fund it, sounds like they're willing to fund this, and that is the economic development arm of the Joint Powers Authority of the governments. You know, Supervisor Finnegan, I'm not sure the status, if you ask me today, what is the status of tri agency as we speak today? So I'm going over that, I'm hurtling over that and bringing it right to the board's attention. We have an opportunity to bring someone up here with that information goes directly to a, a redeveloped tri-agency or something to supplant it, I'm not sure, but I can't sit here and tell you what the status of tri-agency is today unless you can shed some light on that. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Um, isn't this the same man that comes up through the chamber that we've had in the past? No, he came uh, about four years yeah. ago. Yeah, um, that does the analysis. Yeah, he, that had done an analysis yeah. um, at that And point. isn't he connected to the most recent analysis that was just published that came through the uh, local transportation? I don't think it was Shell that was on that. You mean the one that Tamara put together at uh, Yeah, I don't know who did it, but he, I, I don't think it was Shell. Well, he's retired. He's been, Whoa, he, I'm asking he, he used to be, uh, he's retired from uh, uh, but he was our Cal contact Ed. before. Yeah, Cal Ed is, yeah. yeah he, he was our contact before. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. I just want a clarification on who he was. The other possibility is that we could add this to the city county agenda and discuss it then, which might make sense, especially since we're both going to be potentially you, funding the thing. Yeah, why don't you do that, because that is the venue that he made his presentation to last time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So that's, that's uh, it, it pushes out a little bit, but it's still a priority in terms of, and it is something the city is going to have to be involved in. Absolutely. Uh, for sure. So any other items? Okay, at this, at this moment, we will go on to number 18. Direct staff to prepare a letter to Department of Finance in relation to public safety as requested by the county administrator officer. I so move. That's the letter we received. Second. Second. And for the publics, you want to give just a brief Late last week, we were. It, this has been kind of fluid. We were told originally that the funding would be made available in September, but be prepared. And so, as of late last week, um, a survey came out through CSAC, I believe it was, asking for the impacts of AB 109 realignment on public safety. Um, I've completed that survey uh, with the assistance of the auditor controller. Um, we're in the ballpark of $700,000 worth of loss in revenue. Um, they, they wanted to go specifically to one year, which was 12-13, so it's projected out over actually part of 10-11 and 11-12. Um, the letter reflects that survey. The letter actually is uh, uh, proactive to the survey, but I think that we were, I was the first one to complete it and get it in because it's competitive and we were going to use anybody and everybody to get the word out of what the impact is, especially on small counties where they've limited bed space. And as you know, I've used the words unintended consequences. I know that's being used um, throughout this uh, survey. The issue comes down to the fact that you will have incarceration, even though the, the entire attempt at 109 is to not incarcerate. You have flash incarceration. You also have the uh, consequences of people that are uh, being, would have been at state prison being at longer terms within our jail. And associated with that are costs of medical, costs of food. There's a lot of different things that enter into that. Um, we've established that. I've had discussions with the sheriff. I've had discussions with uh, our advocates and uh, represented in that letter and will continue on. So you may see me back again. I'll certainly be talking with uh, Supervisor Finnegan on the CSAC end of things, and uh, we're going to do whatever we can to uh, make sure that we can get some form of compensation that, on the impact from the loss of the in-custody drug treatment program. Okay. So did you draft this letter or did the sheriff? I did. Okay. I think it's the key point is not so much to talk about how hard it's going to be on us, which is everybody's making the same case and the real thing on these growth dollars is Southern California but especially the the Valley counties are going to be going after that money and it is the small rural counties that are going to be most affected in some cases but as you well know in our conversations with you and with Karen Lang um, that it is that one-time drug 
diversion program that we suffered hit about $900,000. And we were told when we visited down there last year that we couldn't get it last year, but we could get it this year because there was some money that was being set aside. And it's focusing on that, call it a, uh, a veiled promise of coming back after that specific one-time thing. Now, is this talking about ongoing? Uh, not at this point. Okay. The growth fund is, it looks to be a one-time transition, let's put it that way. I mean, because that's what I'm getting at the way the letter was written. It almost makes it seem like it's, oh, woe is us, and this is going to continue to happen, rather than hit them hard with the hammer that, hey, this was an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. It cost us, we played the game, we like, you know, we bought into it, but you cost us $900,000 and we need some, you know, some help. Yeah, I stressed in there what the proactive part of Delmar County, which was the uh, community partnership uh, that was led by probation and the fact that we had a plan in place and that the preliminary reports that came out put Del Nord at number four in all of the state for being proactive. Um, the survey that came out, we hit on every item in there for having that plan in our plan and having it implemented. There was one community outreach that is in place but uh, has not completely uh, has not been completely initiated, but everything else, uh, probation led the way along with the uh, community group, uh, and uh, that may be changing also, the faces in that community group. Would you, you know, you CC, you sent it to Anna and Diane Cummins on finance. You also sent it to uh, for Will Shafsma and Karen Lang, but would you send CC, um, CSAC on that? Sure. I don't know if it was Rosemary Poole or wherever the staffer is, or just CSAC in general. Matt. Send it to Matt. He's well aware of what's going on with corrections. Sure. We can get up to him. All right. Any other comments or questions on that particular letter? Okay. Uh, Tony, can you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Okay, we are now adjourned until next Tuesday. Oh, we have closed session. We are going into closed <coughs> session. Stand corrected.